house of the Lord with all of you. I don't know what kind of week anybody has had. I don't know what kind of people you all have had to deal with. But now is the time that you come together, you fellowship, and you worship with each other. So I just want you all to take time right now to bring it all to his throne. Bring it to his altar. Bring it to him. Everything, anything that has happened, good or bad, Bring it here and say thank you. Bring it here and say, Lord, I need help. Bring it here and say, Lord, what should I do? This is the time to bring it as well. It is Bowl Sunday. And that is a ministry we have here. It caters to people age 18 to 29. So if you have anybody that is in that age, Please come see us after service. We're recruiting y'all. It's like the army. Yeah. Um, so either way, we're going to start with our call to worship. I'm going to ask everybody please to stand. Tell them who you are. All right. Y'all look all, y'all look so nice in your pink. Okay. I call heaven and earth to ignore this day against you that I set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Deuteronomy 30, 19. Choose life. Yes, amen. Um, that will be followed by our congregational hymn, What a Fellowship.
have a scripture reading by Brother Thomas. Thanks, Carly. Good morning, church family. Good morning. My name is Thomas Quanna. I'll be reading the scriptures this morning. Um, it's going to be coming from Job 32, verses 1 through 9. Please say amen when you're ready. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Are we ready now? All good, okay. All right, Job verses 32. This is the word of the Lord. So these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then the wrath of Elahu, the son of Barakel, the Busite, of the family of Ram, was aroused and against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. Also against the, his three friends, wrath, sorry, his wrath was aroused because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now because they were years older than he, Elahu, had waited to speak to Job. When Elahu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was aroused. So Elahu, the son of Barako, the, the Busite, answered and said, I'm young in years, and you are very old. Therefore I was afraid, and dare not declare my opinion to you. I said, age should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is, no, there is a spirit in man, and, he, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Amen. Great men are not always wise, nor do the age always understand justice. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll be uh, praying this morning. You may be seated. You all may be seated. Allow us to humble our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come to your throne of grace this morning. Father, we thank you just to be in your presence yet again, Lord. This morning, Father, I just pray, Father, for everyone in this this church, Father, that um, that everyone may have a heart of flesh, Father, not a heart of stone, Lord. Open up everyone's hearts, ears, and minds, Father, to receive your word this morning, Father. Bless the speaker, Brother Adams, Lord. Allow him to deliver the word, Father, not from him, Father, but from you. Lord, um, please help us, Father, in this day, allow at least one person, everyone, Father, to take the word, take it home, Father, and live it out, Lord. And at least one person, Father, may give them life to Christ, Father, and quicken them, Lord Jesus. We ask you these things in your Holy Son, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm being ready to praise the Lord. Say you know. 
special guest announcement. <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. <laughs> Let's start that over. Next, we will have Isaiah greeting our special guest, followed by announcements. Amen. Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <clears throat> All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I have the privilege of welcoming all of our special guests to Huber Memorial Church. Now, if you are a special guest, you're probably wondering, is that me? Well, if you have to wonder, that is you. <laughs> so at this very moment, would our special guests please rise, show yourselves so that we can greet you in our own Huber way. So if this is your first time visiting, or if this is your first time visiting in a while, please stand. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's good to see you guys. Uh, if you are coming from another church, send our greetings back when you go. The ushers, they are handing you a card and a pen. Now, we will ask you to fill out that card and pen, and when you leave out in the lobby, to the right, there is a cross on the wall. Go to that desk, and then, you know, give them that card and the pen, and then they will give you a nice little secret prize. Ah, yes. So, Huber Memorial family, if you wouldn't mind, let's go ahead and wave to our special guests, give them a nice thumbs up, a nice heart, and one of them nice little Wakanda salutes. All right, God bless you. Oh, y'all do look good in pink out there. <laughs> Wow, that's nice. Uh, my name is Barbara Whedon. I stand here on behalf of the drama ministry. We are getting prepared for our Christmas play. 
So let me tell you real quick, I'm not gonna talk long, because I gotta get back to my little friend who's usually hanging on my shoulder. But we are in need. We are in need of six angels. We are in need of 12 disciples. And some of y'all saying, I can't act, I can't, you know what? This play is designed one or two lines, okay? This about maybe two or three for the angels. But for the disciples, all you're gonna say is, is it I? <laughs> is it I, Lord? <laughs> if you read the scripture, you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. I need 12 men. Come on now, 12 men. I know you out there. I seen you in the choir. Yes, thank you, brother. Woo, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh my, this is wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. We need a Mary Magdalene. Come on, Mary Magdalene, I know you out there. Woo! Excellent, excellent. Now, we need a crowd. Is there a crowd out there? Thank you. It doesn't matter what your age. Come on out, join us. I would like to tell you that this afternoon, if you're really interested, come on and sign up in the overflow. Okay? Come to the overflow and sign up. And my dream team, where are you? You're the ones who help behind the scenes, set the props up and all. I need to see you right after the service, okay? God bless you, that's all I want to say right now. I'll talk to you later. See you in the overflow. Good morning, family and visiting friends. We are already halfway through the month of October. And October 31st will be here before you know it. October 31st is when we take back the night. Take back the night. That's one of Huber's largest evangelistic outreaches to fulfill our mission of rescue, redeem, and recreate. Recreate our children, um, redeem our families and our communities. We have the privilege, we have the responsibility, we have the duty and the pleasure to not just affect, but also infect the Ramblewood community. And we get a chance to do that one mind, one life, one heart, one home, and one car at a time. A car that's filled with children, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, right? We get an opportunity to share with them the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. What a privilege that is. Amen. What a privilege to be a light in this world on Halloween night a night that's been deemed by society and culture to be a very dark day. We get the privilege, we get the privilege, we get the opportunity to share Christ, to share the love of Christ, to share his kindness. To, as a family of believers, we get the privilege to share the good news with all of those that come through. And so we want to, again this year, fill up both parking lots we want your ministries to register, to sign up, to let me know you're going to be there because you're going to need a parking pass so that the security will know that you're going to be participating. You might want to give candy out at home, but you don't have to do that. You can fill your car up and you can bring your car here to the parking lot, open your trunk and allow them to come through and get candy from you. So let me know of your attendance that you're going to be there on Halloween, Thursday, October 31st. We begin at 6, but if you're going to participate, you need to be here by 5, no later than 5.30. I do my best to try to feed you, to try to make sure you get a little something to eat before you get started. And so pick up your parking pass today from me. Let me know you're going to be there. And then on October the 19th, all that candy that you all have been bringing in, putting it in those tubs out there, we're going to be bagging up. However, if you are part of a ministry and your ministry is going to be participating, make sure you give your candy to that ministry. I'm looking forward to seeing you all October 31st. God bless you. 
Don't forget to see me for your parking pass. Good morning, Huber Church. Good morning. My name is Dr. Ashley Green, and I am here to tell you about a wonderful opportunity for you, for me, for all of us. So as Doc Branch uh, mentioned last week, I wanna just give you some logistics about how you can be a part of the Huber history. So we remember at the cookout, we burned the mortgage. And so we are going to sign the back of the commu commutative mortgage note. So if you would like to be a part of that, please meet in the overflow on October 20th and 27th. So that's next Sunday and the following Sunday. The times are before service, 8.30 to 9 a.m. and after service. Now, if you want your name to be on that mortgage note, and I would love for your name to be there, please don't show up at eight o'clock. And if you would like for your name to be on that mortgage note, and I too would love your name to be on that mortgage note, please don't fellowship with your family members. Come directly after service to the overflow so you can have your name signed on the back of that note. Because I want to see everyone's name on the back of the note so that our generations to come can see what the Lord has done for Huber Memorial Church. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Calvin Williams. I'm just reminding everyone about the health fair that's coming up this Saturday, October the 19th. Okay, all right. So sure, so it's gonna be October the 19th from 11 to two o'clock. This year we'll have speakers talking about mental health, targeting specifically teenagers, also about breast cancer, and about obesity and nutrition. We'll have plenty of vendors, it's completely free. Everyone's encouraged to come. Uh, we'll have some games outdoors and we'll have our annual Family Feud game if you signed up. All right, so take care. Come out on October the 19th. We will now have as an offering. Welcome to Huber Memorial Church. As you know, we worship in the Huber Community Life Center. The center is the building and Huber Memorial is the body. If you're a part of the body, let's stand, please. Let's stand, please. Let's thank and praise God for what he has done through us. The Bowl Ministry has done an excellent job thus far, am I correct? They lead us as we go forward. We're glad for your presence and your support. Please, please continue to be an encouragement to them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You may have a seat, you may have a seat. Remember the announcements. There's a lot going on and you don't wanna be uh, excluded because you're included and you're expected, all right? Grateful for this opportunity to stand before you. Before I get to the offering, there are a couple of things we need to do. We're anticipating our children coming forth. Our youth are ushering, so please honor the direction that they're given, that they give you. There are a couple things I need to say to you as we prepare to go forward. I need to introduce you to the brotherhood that I'm a part of. The Lord Jesus Christ, God got me into law school in 1970, the University of Michigan. But these brothers on this road got me out. <laughs> they got me out. I'm going to introduce them. I'm going to introduce them. They taught me all the law that I knew. They helped me get by my final exams. They helped me take two bar exams and pass and helped me get my license. So I'm grateful. I want to introduce them. I want to introduce them, please. Right here is a young name, man named Mr., and your name is Maury, Blondell Maury and his bride, Miss Phyllis. Please stand. Turn around, smile. Turn around, smile. Turn around, smile. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. All right? 
they are now living in Charlotte, North Carolina, retired, okay? Mr. and Mrs. Blair, please stand. Turn around and smile. Thank you, thank you. They're living in Ann Arbor now. God bless you. Thank you, thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Dillard, please stand. Turn around and smile. Good. They're now living in Atlanta. Good, please. Brother Bronson and his bride, please stand. They're living here in Maryland, in Manchester, so they're right. Thank you, thank you, Brother Bronson. This is Brother Clint Kennedy and his bride. They're in Lansing. Now, we took a blood oath that what we did in Ann Arbor stays in Ann Arbor. Okay? <laughs> We entered in 70, we got out together in 73, we've gone back for reunions every year for 50 years, but the law school stopped giving you a reunion after 50 years. And we say, well, later for y'all, we'll get our own reunion. So they pulled in town, they pulled in town Friday, they'll be pulling out tomorrow, okay? Now, they're flying out. Daryl, as you know, is working with our uh, food ministry tomorrow so I'm going to need some help getting them to the airport if you're going to be able to help me get them to the airport on time please check with Jack sign up check with Miss Tanny thank you Miss Tanny please stand Miss Tanny please stand Miss, she's been on her medication all week and she <laughs> she helped uh, me Dolores and Tama and of course um Daryl, Daryl was our chauffeur, on time, driving the van. We just had an excellent time of fellowship. Now, let me say this. I told him I was to tell her this. Now, this is, uh, stand up, stand up, Godfrey. Godfrey is an international criminal lawyer. He's retired now, right? He got a call from P. Diddy <laughs> for representation, all right? He done gave all his money to these other lawyers and, and 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 he said I need to talk to Jeff that's his that's his street name Jeff so went and got Jeff Jeff communicated with him thank you Jeff remain standing <laughs> Jeff turned around say Diddy I know a guy so he called Blair stand up Blair <laughs> Blair is the bag man and he got to hook up to everybody else Jeff said Blair I'm trying to get uh, Diddy a bail. So uh, Blair said, look, let me call Larry. Larry is a bondsman. He's in insurance now. He's a bondsman, right? Okay. So he got Larry, right? And then he said, you know, I, I think I may need an inside man. And, and, and Larry said, well, how about Keebler? He's a retired uh, federal prosecutor, right? <laughs> Stand up, Keebler. All right. We got a dream team here, right? And so Godfrey said, you know what? You know we got to get the right judge. And uh, Keela say, I know a guy. Call Clint. In, in, in. <laughs> right? All right? Good. Now, Jeff said, well, well, what if we don't win, right? We got a guy. That's my buddy David. David was not well this morning, but all he does is appeals, right? So Dave going to do the appeal. And so in making their plea to the court, they say, you, you'd be good if you was a member of a church. <laughs> so they called me. I, I say, hold it, man. <laughs> he say, hey, Smitty, I got Diddy. He needs some help. I say, wait, man, you know I got a reputation. We're a good, solid church. And he said, no, all you got to do is witness to him and baptize. I said, no, man, we got a good side. He said, he'll tie it. <laughs> all right? <laughs> I said, I think we got a plan, Jeff. <laughs> Let's thank him, please, God. Good, 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 good. Good, 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 good. Good, 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 good. And I'm telling you, we were in law school, and they made the mistake of giving us 
take home exams. You're going to do it on your own, on the honor system. <laughs> we went to one man's house. It was a five, day, a five, five days for the exam or 10 days. We ate, slept, ate pizza for, for 10 days, slept on the floor. Let me tell you, God got us in. But the bonding that we had, the fellowship, the support group that we had got us out. Are you listening to me? Let's thank and praise God for our good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And let me say this, let me say this. As you know, when it comes to life and living on this side and on other, it's all about or it ain't about nothing. And the older the relationship, the more valuable it is, right? The older the relationship, and so we've been rolling since we were 20. I used to say I'm running out of people who remember me when I was 12, but now I'm running out of people who remember me when I was 20. We had a great life. We grew up together. Now we're growing old together. God is gracious. Good. Now, they're going to be sitting there. I didn't want them too close. They didn't want to make them uncomfortable, right? So uh, at the end of the service, I'm going to bring them up. I need you to give them a handshake and a hug because they were invaluable to my life. Got it? I want you to thank them. Now, they were shocked that, that I had some folk that called me pastor. I is the pastor. Is that yeah, you? Right, pastor. <laughs> they say, Smitty. I say, wait a minute. I'm the pastor. <laughs> but we've been blessed. And we've been blessed. I'm grateful to everything the Lord is doing in and through us. I'm grateful for your presence. He's blessed us as a family. He's blessed us as a, as a team. And we can only say, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Savior. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Good. The Gen X will have their Bible study tomorrow, and we'll be collecting our goodies for trunk or treat. All right? And Will, stand up, Will. Will is in charge of that ministry, and he's going to give us some directions. So when we bring our stuff tomorrow, we'll be putting it someplace secure for Halloween. Now, let me do this and we're done. Everybody is seeing this, right? We are the pipeline. We have the, to the one with all the supplies, everything to meet every need. He has it, right? We're the pipeline and we connect him to the people who have the greatest need, am I right? And as long as we remain open, he will keep this pipeline filled and flowing for our people, for his glory and our people. That's what our giving is now. If you recall, we were paying $100 a day interest on the loan. We paid an $8 million loan off in eight years. That is not because we are a mega church. We just serve a mega God. So there are some things we can now do. I want you to continue to give. There are some things we can now do because we got some the mortgage money that we would pay the bank. We now can use it to help God's people. Let me, let, let me make some suggestions. Let me make some suggestions. I already told you, there's some kids with cancer at St. Jude. We're going to send them some money. Shriners Hospital for Children, children born with uh, bodily defects. We're going to send them some money. You know how we used to get water and toilet tissue to send to folk in, in, in Florida and other places with uh, natural disasters, we're not going to do that. 
we're going to send some money to uh, Samaritan's Purse. That's a Christian organization run by Billy Graham's son. They're already in Asheville. They're already in Florida on the ground doing it. We're going to send them some money. Then the 700 Club in Virginia Beach, they have a ministry called Operation Blessing, right? We don't have to go down there. We don't have to buy supplies and find a way to ship them. We're going to send them some money. They're already on the ground. Now, do we have to take a vote? Let's take a vote. Everybody who wants to support the use of the finances that God has blessed us with and to help somebody else, just please stand. I think that's a majority. Let's thank and praise God. Let's thank and praise our God. While we're standing, let's remain standing. Our trustees are going to come. Our trustees are going to come. Miss Keita, come with our babies. Come with our babies. Come with our babies. Come with our babies. Miss Keita, you're going to take the mic and introduce our, your helpers. Come on, Brennan. There's some things I need some ushers to give out as you come with your tithe, your gift, and your offering. Stand tall, stand tall, stand tall. Thank you. Miss Shorty, thank you. Mr. Leroy, thank you. Who is that? Brother Ford, thank you, thank you. Mr. Wright, thank you, sir. Brennan, do I need another usher over here? I need an usher in the middle to give out the, the little card. This is information about our upcoming family. You got it, Jack? Okay, good, good, good. Good, good, good. I commend the parents who started planning Friday in order to get these babies up and here on Sunday. Let's commend these young parents. <laughs> Ms. Keita, please identify your helpers. Then, I'll, then you're going to pray. Then we're going to give our tithes, our gifts, our offering, and we'll become. We'll be going forward. Ms. Keita. Good morning, family. Good morning. This morning I have um, my teachers are... Linda Llewellyn, Valerie Greer, Arnold Hamilton, Kelvin Lawson, and Barbara Alexander is here, but she may be setting up her classroom. And I have a lot of helpers. So um, let's um, humble our hearts and pray for our children. Father God, it's in the name of Jesus Christ. We come before you this morning in prayer. Father God, we just thank you once more for being our one and only true and living almighty God. We thank you, Father God, most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, Father God, because we are sinners, and we do ask for the forgiveness of all our sins. Father God, we, right now we ask you to just bless our children. We thank you so much for them. They are such a gift, Father God, and we know that they are our future, Father God. We just ask that you use us so that they can glorify you, Father God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, thank you. Please bless the offering. Father Deacons. God, please um, thank you for this gift we are about to give. Let them be used to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you come. God bless you as you give.
presenting our speaker for today. Amen. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Olivia Adams, and it's my honor to introduce Father, AKA Brother Derek Adams, as our teacher from the pulpit this morning. Unfortunately, my sister Gabrielle Adams is not here to help me introduce him like we did last year. Um, because she's in North Carolina being a scholar. Amen. So, but she's with me in spirit. Um, yes. So Derek Adams is someone that Huber knows very well. He graduated from Woodlawn High School and Howard University with a ma major in architecture. Um, he's a man of many talents. He's a licensed architect, winning softball coach, entrepreneur, a barbecue pit master, a historian, Bible study teacher, and a faithful husband to my mom, his wife, Tanja Adams. Hi, mom. Okay. Um, outside of being a hardworking family man, he's a devout man of God. He's passionate about sharing the word, um, especially to young adults. To, this led him to becoming the advisor to the Bold Ministry, and we are happy and lucky to have him. Yay, you. And... Without further ado, coming to bring the word, my dad, Brother Derek Adams. God is, is the reassurance 
is God is God is it's more important of what he is and what he is not the reality is this work the reality is that God is the sustainer the author the finisher of my life creator of all things the blesser of every good and perfect gift I get a little choked up sometimes when I get up here and think about this thing because one other thing I've realized about God being is, his isness is not relative or not based upon my acceptance of his isness. He is because he is, not because I think he is, not because I want him to be, or not that I, whether or not I even believe that he is, but he is. And so it matters more for us to get on his page and realize that because he is, I need to just step in line. He is not dependent upon us. We are dependent upon him. And I thank him, that's my, my aunt's, I wish she were here, I don't know if she's here, but that's my aunt, Angela, if she's listening remotely. That's like her favorite song. And she sings it, and she sings it well, and I love when she sings it, and I thank you, choir, for singing it um, and bringing forth that word. I thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, all. Uh, welcome to Huber Memorial. That's been done earlier in our bold emphasis Sunday. Um, as I was so nicely introduced earlier by my oldest daughter, Olivia, uh, I am Derek Adams. I am not a preacher. I am a Bible study teacher. But that being said, I will use the gifts that God has given me to present his word to you, and he'll give them through me to you. So I thank you for your, for your attendance and being here. I thank the church, the, the church uh, ministry, the lay people, the support, pastor, thank you for allowing your pulpit to be shared by someone as myself layman as myself. Um, I want to thank my family that may be here, our friends that are here, my aunts, uncles, remotely, wherever they may be. I always have to thank my grandparents um, in their absence and their um, rejoicing with the Lord for leaving the seeds of faith in us and me, Pastor Timothy Boyd and Reverend Wilhelmina Watts. Um, both co-laborers in Christ. To my brothers and sisters of co-laborers in Christ, thank you for being here. My brothers in the bond, the Diggs boys that may be here in the back. Teleosis, you guys know what that means. And to my family, again, to my wife, thank you for being my support and being there for me and encourage me when I sometimes need encouragement because we all do from time to time. So... My mom, if she's out there, she just, hi, mom. Mom just celebrated 79, so she just. <clears throat> and appreciate that. And um, thank you for all again for being here. So last year when we talked, we stepped, I, was, I uh, brought a message last year, and we were talking about uh, bold and, and investing in bold. And I hope that from last year's message, bold was encouraged to follow certain things that Timothy had presented, that t was presented to Timothy by Paul. And the ministry and the, everybody else in the congregation was encouraged to invest in them as Timothy was invested in by Paul. And so we're going to continue a little bit where we were from last year. Pick that up. It's about, you know, if you took your notes from last year and you're still around, still have them, you pull them out. But, <clears throat> but we'll go in and dig into it and let you know. So if you uh, bear with me. So let's, let's pray before we get into, this, get into this word. 
Father God, I do thank you for this time and this occasion. Father, I thank you for all of your opportunities and your blessings, O oh Lord. I thank you for the gifts that you've given me. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the talents that you've given me and, and gave me the heart not to leave them and bury them under a, a bushel and hide them, but that you might use me, that I might be, be able to share them to your people. Lord, forgive me for my sins and iniquities and remove from me anything that may be a hindrance for the free flow of your spirit through me, that your word might be disseminated among your people, that it may find home in their hearts and in their lives, that they may be able to use them for their daily living. O oh Lord, make me, put me an instrument, as an instrument in your hands, O oh Lord. Make me, a, <clears throat> make me a spoon or a nipple, O oh Lord, that may be able to feed the babes of your, of your faith, the pablum and the milk of your word, a knife and a fork, O oh Lord, that I may be able to cut the meat of your word to feed your mature. Lord, make me a ladle that I may be able to pour out a blessing. Make me a cup that I may be able to receive your blessing and make me a saucer that I may be able to receive the overflow of your blessing from my overflowing cup. Lord, I just thank you now. Just use me in your divine hands for this divine purpose. And this is your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So if we're going to go to Job. Let's open up Job. That's where we're going to start. Some people might look at it and think it should be called Job, but... We go to Job, verse 32, chapter 32, verses 1 through 9. We're going to start there. We're going to start there. The lesson is who is, where is Elahu? Who is your Elahu or Elihu? Okay, where is Elihu and where is your Elihu? So we go to, to the chapter 32, verse 1. So these three men ceased answering Job because he was, Job that is, was righteous in his own eyes. Then the wrath of Elihu, the son of Berakel the Buzite, of the family of Ram was aroused against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends, his wrath was aroused because they had found no answer and yet they condemned Job. Now because they were years older than he, Elihu had waited to speak to Job. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was aroused. So Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzzite, answered and said, I am young in years, and you are very old. Therefore I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. I said, age should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But, conjunction, junction, what's your function? <laughs> Hooking up two words, phrases, and clauses. And what came before is different than what's going to come after. But, there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Great men are not always wise. Nor do the age always understand justice. <laughs> that's where we're going to, that's where we're going to launch from last year, if you remember, we're talking about this. Uh, we use this as a launch point to talk about do not let anyone despise your youth. That was what Paul had told Timothy as Timothy was growing up as a young minister in the faith. And that oftentimes young people get overlooked, not thought of as being serious, thought of as being wild and out, dumb, immature, so on and so forth. Paul was trying to teach Timothy not to do that or not to be like what others would assume others to be, but to be something different, to be something that God had called him to be. So if I had to use the examples, and we use, Pastor uses the specs all the time, we're going to go through this, and specs being S-P-E-C-S. So the first S is a sin to confess 
P is a promise. E is an example. C is a command. And the other one is a situation. S is a situation to avoid. And then what we're going to see here, the three things that have come out. One is a sin to confess. Job's got something to talk about. We talk about Job all the time in a positive light, but something that we always miss about Job. And then as an example to emulate, Elihu, the young man, was somebody to emulate. And it's something that even for older people to look to, to find something in him to emulate. And in a situation to avoid, Lord knows I do not want God to teach me any lessons that have to go through what Job went through. If I'm to learn something, I pray to the Lord, Lord, do not allow me, please do not. Let me go through what he went through to get to what he got and where he had to be at the end of it. I, 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 I don't want that kind of thing. But because God is, the question to all of us would have to be, if God does not bless us any more than he has today, would we still serve him? If all that he's done for us here right now, and he, want, he would not bless us any more than what he has already, would we still serve him? That's a question for all of us, because that was a question that was facing Job too. But here's the thing, and, and we're going to get into this. So we talked about that, about Timothy, last year. So let no one despise your youth. And Bold was counseled to be an example in word and conduct and love and spirit, faith, and purity. That's what 1 Timothy 4.12 talks about. The church was admonished, encouraged to invest in them, to help raise them up just as Timothy had, just as Paul did Timothy. He did not see Timothy's age as being a, cru a crutch, but an asset. If I pour into him now, what they can do now, what is it going to net the return later? We talk about it all the time, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they grow old, they should not depart from it. Sometimes when we do that, if we do that, we need to cut the reins and let them do it. Let them go. Right. We can't keep holding on to them right. as much as we want to. We got to let the birds fly. And then my daughter, if she's watching online, Eagles, NCCU, y'all get that. But the, if we look at this and we look at Job in whole, Job, the book of Job is, is one of the wisdom books. One of the wisdom books of the Bible, it starts at Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Those are the five wisdom books. And it's interesting because the way Job is written, if you were to look at it and read it, it's written much like a play. It's got the prologue. It's got the exposition. It talks about what's going on. You have a rising action and the constant buildup of what's happening in, in Job's life. And then all of a sudden you have the climax, Job, you know, Job showing up, I mean God showing up. Then you have the instance that happens right after God shows up. And then you have the epilogue or the resolution at the end where Job finally realizes his error, comes to repent, and then God blesses him as a result. So if you look at it and you look at the whole thing and how it was written, it's, it's, it could be a play. It's probably been a play. Because there's been movies and so on and so forth. So we look at this. The whole book chronicles Job's life. In the beginning, it talks about his bountiful blessings. That he has his, all these materials, lost his material possessions, had ten kids, lost his kids. Satan afflicted him with poor health. He faced public shame from his friends and private scrutiny from his wife. You're going to let this happen to you? God is doing all this to you? Curse him, curse God, and die. That's his wife. That's the bone of his bone. That's the flesh of his flesh. That's the one that's supposed to be his ace boon coon, the one his rider died. She said, curse God and die. He couldn't turn to his wife. Who could he turn to? So God, and this is a crazy thing about this. 
God tested Job's faith. And by God's own admissions in verse 8 in chapter 1, God, Job was a good man. Blameless, that means he was sinless. He was blameless, he had a good reputation. And God, Satan came to him as some kind of cosmic game. And that's why I'm saying, I don't want God, I don't want Satan and God to be playing. I don't want that to happen. I don't want Satan to go up to God, you know, and knock and say, you know, Lord, it, it, that brother Derek right there. I don't know if he's going to serve you if, you if you just let me have him. If I take stuff from him, is he still going to serve you? And God, and God said, look, Satan, you think you got this thing? Look, you go ahead. You can take everything you want from him. But don't touch him. One thing we need to realize and understand something about this, when God's has a protection is around you, and this is the thing, if you are his child, Satan can vex you, but he cannot possess you. He can vex, but not possess. That's the difference. Vexing is external. Possession is internal. Greater is he that is in you that is in the world. So no way that the strong man can, no way that the strong man can be bound up if Satan were to try to come into your house because he's the, you are the residence of God, Amen. your body. So all of what Satan did was all external. But even with that, I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want that, I don't want that to happen to me. Lord, find another way. <laughs> Teach me some other kind of way. I don't want all that to happen. But I got to realize that, again, God is. So in that, at the end of this, God re realized that God allowed these events to happen. <sighs> I don't want that. But I remember, I remember my own personal life. There were three events that happened to me. One, I purchased a house, just purchased my first house, and immediately after I purchased my first house, I lost my job. I had a cold house that had flooded out because of a, of a massive snowstorm, had no job, and had to figure out what I was going to do. Well, God had figured that out already. He said, you're going to take this time now that you have this peace and solitude in this cold house, and you're going to learn of me. You're going to get closer to me. Because remember your prayer that you wanted this house. And you asked for 10 things in this house. And all 10 things I provided you in this house, even to the penny of the cost. So therefore, if I gave it to you, then don't you think you trust me enough to sustain you through it? Yes. Okay. I'm going to learn from you. I heard of you. Now I'm going to get a chance to really sup with you, see you. Now you're going to be in my place of residence. That's me, no empty, empty, no furniture, cold, wet, leaky windows, but it's just me. Another time I lost a job. Another time I lost a job. It's a good thing that my wife was faithful because I lost like three, four jobs and I courtship. And every time I lost a job, she didn't leave me. Because she could have easily said, that brother can't keep a job. I got to find another. I got to find somebody else. But she didn't. But I lost a job, another job, and then all of a sudden, because I lost that job, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? But I have a family now. I got a family. got a house. got a home. Got, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He allowed me to lose that job, but then he ended up setting me up that I had to start my own company. <clears throat> so sometimes the stuff we go through, the tragedies we go through, the heartaches, the pains, and so on and so forth, if they're not there to destroy us or crush us, they're there to bless us if, if, if we allow God to do that. Sometimes we want to be the master manipulator of our lives, and sometimes we need to really just let go and let God. We say it all the time, but do we really do it? So when we get in this thing, again, Job has this conversation with his friends. We're going to get to Elihu. We're going to get to Elihu. We're going to get to him. Elihu, Elihu, Elihu. So in Job, his friends, now people criticize Job's friends, but three things that Job's friends did right. 
okay? They realized they had a friend that was suffering. Job's friends came to his need. That's the first thing. They weren't in the same place. There were three different places. So they came from wherever they were to where Job was to be where he, where he was and to be and to serve his needs. They showed empathy. Right? They mourned with him. Mourn with they that mourn. Rejoice with they that rejoice. They ripped their clothes. They covered themselves in ashes as a sign of you know, Jewish culture, the sign of expression of grief and humility and repentance. They, and they stayed with him for seven days before they even spoke. Sometimes, you know, you know, you go some, you know people are mourning. Sometimes you go over people's houses. You just want to sit with them. That was one of those terms that you know, old folk used to say. You know, the scenes, I'm just going to go sit with them for a minute. And that's what they would do. They would do all kinds of stuff in and around the house. They would sit down in the living room and just sit. Sometimes their presence was comfort enough to the person mourning that I thank you. You don't have to say anything to me, but your presence here helps me. They did that. But then when it got wrong, they basically associated Job's curses, the things that happened to him, and associated with a sin that Job may have committed in his life. That's not always the case. In this case, these things happened that Job may learn a lesson. There was a sin, yes, but the lesson was something bigger than what the sin that Job committed. It was a part of that, but we'll see it later. But that wasn't it. Sometimes we say, oh, things are going bad for him. He must have did something wrong with the Lord. He done did something, Lord, mad with him. And that isn't the case. It wasn't the case. They had a dialogue with Job. In the futility of a dialogue, they express their earthly wisdom without spiritual insight. If your opinion is your opinion and it's not wrapped or laced in anything in God's word, it's just your opinion. And oftentimes we do that. Where are you coming from with what you're saying? Where, who said that? Where does that say that? about? Where is what you're saying have any kind of spiritual insight or godly wisdom in it? Because it's just an opinion. Everyone has an opinion, like elbows. And as I was saying, everybody has an opinion. <clears throat> Idle chatter. So now we get into the text, the real text. Job 32, 1 through 9. Now, you got this other guy. Everybody knew that Job was there with his three friends, but oftentimes people don't see it, don't know it, or forgot it or whatever. But there was, a fifth, there was a fifth man there. It was Job, his three friends, Bildad, Zophar, and, and uh, Eliphaz. This other guy, Elihu, Elihu. Well, who the heck was he? He didn't say nothing the whole time. He was there just like everybody else. But it says, Job 32, so these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. That was Job's problem. Then the wrath, anger, of Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzzite of the family of Ram, was aroused against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. That was Job. So, Elihu, it was a young man who was young enough to be their grandson. This is the point. He was a young man, not just young enough to be their son, but their grandson. His name means he is my God. Or my God is he. So he's coming with his name. And what's in the name? Everybody knows a name means something. Shows character about who you are as a, as a person, as a character, your family, or something like this. His name means he is my God. Now, the other thing is the son of Berakel, the Buzzite, the family, family of Ram. They're descendants of Noah. Noah's son, Shem. Berakel means God blesses. So here you have a son whose father means God blesses. His name means he is my God. He shows up 
if I know that somehow or another God is going to bless this situation some way, shape, or form. He's coming with something that I need to hear. He's coming with something that's going to be a benefit to me. Because if God is with me, and I can sit here and say, he is my God. That means he's with me. That's a statement of relationship. He's not somebody who's just some oddball guy off the street. He's bringing something with him. He's a young man, a grandson. I want people to understand that. Some, again, we dismiss young folk too often, and we don't look at them for what they really are and their God's blessings to us if we allow them to be. So here we go. The thing is, with Elihu, he was, a, he was one of the E's. He's an example. Elihu was an example. You realize that despite his young age, that he was there to, to minister to Job just like the older guys. So somehow or another, he had a relationship with all of them, or at least Job. And for the fact that he was there with Job and Job saw enough of him to, that he would be there says something about the relationship he had with Job. But the other thing is, is his spiritual insight. His spiritual insight. The characteristics that he had. So he had the relationship with Job. And he had spiritual insight. In verse 1 through 3, we see this, that he saw in one that Job was righteous in his own eyes. And then we see that Job justified himself rather than God. Somehow or another for him to understand that, he had to know what God is and God said in order to combine that and see what Job was saying and then compare and contrast to say, that ain't right, Job. This is who God is. And this is what, late, this is what Elihu later does. So he gets into it and also against the three he saw that he got mad and he said that, no, y'all are wrong too. So what are y'all doing? So he was sitting there, and the thing is, is that when we look at it, the self-righteousness that Job exhibited is a situation to avoid. What is self-righteousness? That's, self, that's all that I asked my class. I would say, ask my class, what is self-righteousness? And I asked people, what do you think? But the reality is, self-righteousness is your individual attempt to meet God's standards based on your own merits. It's your attempt to please God by your way, your measure, not him, not his. And so sometimes we get caught up in doing things or we want to do things we think that are pleasing God. And in reality, they're not. Sometimes we get caught up in just doing, 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 and thinking that our duty is going to please God, but the reality is God wants our devotion. That's a difference. Duty is just work. Devotion is all about love. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's conditional. You can keep my commandments all you want, but if you don't love me, it's going to be like those on the last days. So Lord, Lord, did I prophesize in your name? Lord, Lord, did I cast out demons in your name? Did I do this in your name? Did I do that from your name? And the Lord says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Not that I know you and forgot you. I never knew you. So what I'm sitting here saying is the thing is, is that don't get caught up in stuff, just doing stuff just to be doing stuff. If you don't love God, he don't care. Paul clearly said that in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I may be gifted with this, may be gifted with that, and I have all kinds of gifts and I can give it to the poor, and if, I'm, if I can speak in tongues and interpret tongues and blah, 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 so what? I'm <laughs> clanging cymbals, ching, 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 just sounding brass, making noise. But if you don't have love, it is nothing. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Proverbs 16, 2 says, all the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. What's inside? K 
okay? Here's the thing, back to Elihu. Another thing he had, he had respect for his elders. He had respect for his elders. It wasn't like he disrespected them. He was there and he understood, you know how I used to be, y'all used to be young. Y'all would say, y'all are young, you need to be seen, and what? Not heard. Not heard. I can see you, but don't say nothing. <laughs> Shut up. Don't speak unless you are. There we go. That's black Baptist stuff working right there, ain't it? <laughs> black community all over the place. But, <laughs> but here's the thing. So he said, it, he said it right here. He said that in verse 6, so Elihu the son of Ber, I am young in years and you are very old. Therefore I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. I said age should speak and multitude of years should speak and teach wisdom. So he shut up. Now, he says opinion here, okay? That says opinion. If you look at the Hebrew word, it's not opinion. It means knowledge from a distance, a knowledge from afar off. So what he's really saying, I have, my, I have some knowledge that ain't from around here that I want to share with you. It's not from here. It's from a long way off. If you look at this, what I'm saying, English language is funny. If you dig into the Hebrew and the Greek, it's richer, much richer. I have knowledge from afar off I want to share with you. This is what he's literally saying. So he says that I let you guys speak first. That's a lesson. Be what? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to wrath. He exhibited that quality right there. He got mad. It says it. I let my what? My wrath, he had wrath against Job and to his three friends. But he did not say anything first. He listened first. The key to good communication is listening first. Because then when you speak, you know what the heck you're talking about. Sometimes people speak too fast and don't know what they're saying and get all twisted, torn, and everything else. He shut up. What you say is important, but first listening is the key to speaking. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Elihu was that example. Life and death are in a what? Power of the tongue. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth, but what good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. That's what Job needed. That's what his friends needed. That's Ephesians 4.29. The ironic part about this quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath comes from the book of James, James 1.19. James is considered, particularly that chapter 1, a wisdom, a wisdom chapter. Because early on it says that if any of you lack wisdom, let him... Ask God, who gives to everybody, liberally, without reproach. He's not going to have a reason for denying it from you if you ask him earnestly. Lord, I need some help. What you need help with? I need some help on understanding how to do this, that, or the other. My finances, my relationships with my spouse, with my wife, my babu thing, or whatever it might be. I need some help to understand my career path. I need some help to understand how I need to navigate through this world that I'm living in. I got some jacked up friends and I need to know how to deal with them. I got, I'm, I'm out of a new world. I'm, I'm moving from one world into another world and I got some hangers ons I just lost my watch. <clears throat> it wanted, didn't want to hang on. But so I got to figure out how do I cut them loose without offending them, but better yet, how can I bring them with me to get what I got, to know what I know, to know you who I know. So that's ironic that the wisdom piece would also be there that he exhibited this, Elihu exhibited this, character trait to the men. This young man, all his wisdom here. The other thing is that he exhibited his wisdom, we need to understand this. 
What is wisdom? That's a question. I would ask my class that. I'm asking y'all. What's wisdom? The reality is, and some of the scripture says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, Proverbs 9, 10 through 11. Understanding it, who God is and fearing him, respecting him, and that's the first sign of wisdom right there. But the, notion, the whole thing about it is that three things that are tied with wisdom. Well, wisdom is a part of a three, th- three things. Knowledge, understanding, then wisdom. Knowledge first, understanding second, then wisdom. So what's knowledge? Nothing more than the attainment or gathering of information. As Pastor always says, information is just information. It's just stuff that you know. That's all it is. Understanding is the comprehension of the stuff that you know. It's the insight in the things that you know. Because there are a lot of folk who know a lot of things and don't understand any of it. I've been up in the church a long time. And one of the most disappointing things that ever happened to me in my life, I was in a crisis situation. I can laugh about it now. I did not understand nor fully believe in the Trinity. I read stuff. I didn't understand it. And I went to somebody in the church, to a deacon, an associate minister, and my pastor. I'm in a crisis. Them J-dubs might be right. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Jehovah's Witnesses? They deny the Trinity? They might be right. They couldn't answer me. A deacon, the chairman of the deacon board, one of the associate ministers, and the pastor of the church could not answer me. You know a lot of stuff, but do you understand it? He could, they couldn't. They didn't. They didn't. Thank goodness for Brady Daniels at First Baptist of Guilford in Columbia. I told him on a Bible study, my wife was going, and she wasn't my wife then, was going to stop there and say, I have this issue, I got this crisis, I got this problem, and I told him my situation. He laughed at me. I said, ain't funny, Brady, I'm serious. Take this book, go home, study it, read it, so on and so forth, understand it, come back to me later and tell me what you understand. Then I felt stupid once I understood it. I said, gosh, why didn't I? They don't teach this. You're right, they don't. Why don't they? I don't know. So that's when I realized, as, as Elihu did here, he later, he later says that he understands that the Spirit of God is what gives you wisdom. It doesn't come with age. If you sit at his feet and come under his teaching and his instruction and you earnestly ask, he's not going to say no. How many kids do you know as a parent, if your child comes to you earnestly and has done the right things to say, Mommy, Daddy, I want to know this, I want to know that, you're going to deny him or her. What kind of parent would you be? You get happy off the fact that, wow, I'm glad you actually taken into this. Come on, sit down. As a matter of fact, walk with me. Sit down and sup with me. Let's go out to our favorite hangout or whatever it is and we want to get something to eat. Let's talk. That's what we need to understand. So here's the thing. Wisdom is the proper application of all that we know and understand. Because some people know it, they understand it, but then they don't do it. So what? If you know it and understand it and don't do it, what good is it for you? It's almost as good as you don't know it. And for all of us who are Christians and we understand, we best not know it. Because it's worse that we know and understand and don't do it. Let's not get it twisted. Some of us walk around here thinking, oh no, we know we've done some dumb stuff, even though we've known we're not supposed to do it. I'm not a shucks. I'm I'm glad God looks out for babies and fools. Good gosh. 
Anyway, Elihu notes that both Job and his friends were wrong. That's what fueled his wrath. It says it right there in the scripture. Job was righteous in his own eyes. He justified himself rather than God. And two, verse three, his friends aroused his wrath because they found no answer, and yet they condemned him. Here's the thing. There's a difference between condemnation and judgment. People always talk about, you ain't supposed to judge. Pastor always talk about that spiritual mace. Judge not, yet ye be judged. God is my judge. And he know my heart. You don't need to tell me what I'm supposed to do. Here's the reality. We all judges. You judge that restaurant you went to and you didn't like that food, you judged it, you didn't go back. You complained, you didn't like it. You judge the schools you send your, your kids to. You judge everything, the relationships that you want for your family, for your friends, and for everybody else. There's a judgment there. Condemnation is the, is the final descent on that. I can't condemn anybody, but I can definitely judge it. God is the condemner. No, what you're doing, brother, is wrong. Not based on what I'm saying, but based on what God says. Now, I can't, I have no heaven, no hell to put you in, but what you're doing is wrong. And I ain't going to do that. That's a judgment. I'm not going to hate you for it because the world Bible tells me I'm supposed to love you. And I'm going to love you through it. But what you're doing is jacked up. And I have to be careful not to, not to get self-righteous because the Bible also tells me that I am also susceptible to that fall should I think too highly of myself. So you got Elihu here gets mad, gets angry at what they about what they said and what they did, and then he starts to speak. And the, and the following verses, he starts to speak. We're not going to get too much into how and what he started to speak and all he started to speak on, but the fact there's a whole bunch of stuff that he says. He he he. The one thing though, him being able to speak and speak to the particular situation was the fact that the relationship he had with Job and the other men allowed him a position that he could speak. If he wasn't in that position, he would have had no opportunity to speak in the first place. And I'm sure, like, in some cases, you would be, it happened to me, it happened to me here in the church, actually, that sometimes somebody young speaking to somebody old, somebody older will look at you and condescend to you. Right? That was the thing, and I'll tell you the situation with me. I first start, some of you know I teach this class called The Good Husband. I've taught it, and, and I'm about to change the name because some people, I think, are afraid to take it because they think it's, it's just strictly about a husband. It's a little bit more than that. In the class, the first time I caught this, taught this class back in like 2010, all the heavy-hitting brothers up in the church were in the class. All of them. Associate ministers, trustees, Clay Fleming, <laughs> Gary Brown. Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, um, I forget my brother's name down in Florida now. Oh man. Corvelli McDaniel. Some other folks, both Arnold's in there, Hamilton and Hampton. Oh Lord. And then this one dapper gentleman. Tall brother, good-looking dude. I'll say that he, you know he's prim and proper. You know he had his, you know he had his tall, good-looking, well-spoken dude. He said to me, I said, I said, rest in peace, God bless him, brother Gary Dingle. Just, brother Gary came to me, said, brother, man, I've been married longer than you've been living. What are you going to tell me about marriage? I said, well, Brother Dingle, it's not what I'm going to teach you, but it's what the Lord is going to teach you through me. That's what you're going to learn. So if he allowed himself to listen through me, 
then he'd be all right. Well, Gary took the class three times. <laughs> I said, Gary, you took it once. Man, the class was good, man. I had to come back. <laughs> I know I missed some stuff. You say a lot in that class, man. I got to get some more of that. <clears throat> I said, Gary, it's the third time. Man, I just love your class. <laughs> love the fellas. I said, come on and come on and come on. So the point is, is that when Elihu speaks, if you look at the whole panoply of scripture, Elihu is really the precursor to God coming in the scene, showing up the scene. Elihu basically prepares Job and his friends for God to show up. Elihu, in a sense, was like John the Baptist, proclaiming Jesus before Jesus showed up on the scene. Elihu did that here. He paved the way that God might come in and set things straight. So Elihu has some credibility. He had a relationship with Job that allowed him to be there. And Job is in crisis mode. He don't want to hear a bunch of stuff. What do you got to say to me? Job at least listened to Job's credit. Listen to what Elihu had to say. Question for the older folk out here. Do you got anybody like that in your life? the seasoned seniors out there, is there somebody young that you can actually sit and actually has wisdom of God in them that you can actually listen to them? Because I'm going to sit here and tell you. Uh, Graylin, stand up. Omar, where are them young brothers? All the young brothers in bowl, stand up. Where are they? Well, I know some more in here. Will, I know, Will, I know you ain't been bold, but stand up anyway. <clears throat> There's some other young brothers. Where's Nehemiah? And there's some other young brothers that are not, probably not here right now. Thomas, uh, Chris Robb. We were forging before the movie. If y'all have seen the movie, who hasn't seen the movie Forge? Forge. You've seen the movie Forge? Who's seen it? But what I'm saying is, these brothers right here and me and some other, we've been forging for a couple years now. And I listen to them because it's stuff that I can learn from them the same way they can learn from me. And for me, there were other brothers like Clay Fleming and Gary Brown and some of them other brothers. I'm learning from them, and they're listening to me. That's how it works. That's how it's supposed to work. It's not supposed to be any different than that. So I don't poo-poo them. I remember one of the biggest lessons I learned. I, I, my daughter said I was softball. Y'all brothers are that. I was, I'm a softball coach. Coach softball girls, 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 girls. Girls fast pitch softball for 16 years. When I first started coaching travel ball, I had a young lady, and we were trying to do something and do a drill. And I said, okay, we do it like this. We do it A, we do it B, we do it C. That's how we do it. A, B, C. Coach Derek, yeah. I'm not getting that. I need you to do it A, B, C. She said, Coach Derek, I have to do it A, C, B. Wait a minute. You got to do it A, B, C. Uh, I got to do it A, C, B. Then she tells me, and her mom tells me, well, she's got a learning disability, a learning challenge. And so she doesn't get it A, B, C. She gets it A, C, B. But it didn't really matter, that's how I understood, that it didn't really matter how she got it, but that she got it, and that the end result netted what we both wanted. She was better for it, the team was better for it. I had to give that liberty for let that to happen. Sometimes we gotta do that with them. They're, they're different than we are, they're molded different than we are, the scripture says, once upon a time, God spoke to us through the prophets and so on and so forth. Now he speaks to the young people through visions and dreams and so on and so forth. But if the word is still the same, the message is still the same. The method might change, but we cannot dilute what the word says. We still pour into them. If they got to say stuff through Facebook, they got to say stuff through Instagram and all that other kind of gram, this, that, and the other. If that's how the word gets out, Get it out. That's right. That's right. I, now I'm listening. I gotta listen. Tell me. Teach me something. I'm listening. That's right. That's right. 
and teaching girls for 16 years, working with girls, man. I'm talking about girls. <laughs> From 8, 9, 10, up to 18, 19. Women, some of them women. I had to have a special kind of the Lord help me. <laughs> Listen to these women, <laughs> young ladies. So, back to, back to Elihu, Elihu, Elihu again. So Job and his friends, when Elihu started to speak, they did not dismiss him. They did not condescend on him. They did not silence him. They did not shut him up. Once he started to speak, they listened. They did not say, contradict anything that Elihu said. You have to read further on because it's a lot. You read further on in the scriptures, you'll see that. So in the next five chapters after Elihu speaks, he, re, he, he refuted everything that Job said. He remembered, he listened. Remember, he listened to what Job said, and he's intently taking notes. Job, I heard you say that if you could speak to God, you want to. You want to stand before him, plead your case like an attorney in a courtroom. You want to plead your case to God. You're not right in this. He tells him. Then in 34, he proclaims God's justice, not Job's justice. He condemns Job's self-righteousness in chapter 35. And in chapter 36, he proclaims God's goodness. And in chapter 37, he states that God is to be feared for his great works and unsearchable wisdom. And states that God's power and his impartiality in, verse 30, in chapter 37 as well. It's a lot to say. He unpacked a lot, but the notion is that he realized his age and realized his position, but he realized that great men are not always great in verse 9 from 32 and not always wise, nor do the age always understand justice. He lets them know that because God had given him that and then he began to share it and they at least listened to him. One of the things I want to read to this is this is some stuff right here. Now, this is some stuff because, again, he was a precursor to God showing up and talking. So he comes in here in chapter 37. I'm going to read this for you. I'm going to try to read this like in my thespian type way. You know, I'm not an actor, but sometimes I play one on television. <clears throat> this is what he says. Verse 1 through 5. At this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. Hear attentively to the thunder of his voice. God. He's talking about the God's voice. The thunder. And the rumbling that comes from his mouth, he sends it forth under the whole heaven, his lightning to the ends of the earth. After it, a voice roars. He thunders with his voice, his majestic voice, and he does not restrain them. And when his voice is heard, God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. You know, he's like power, this boom, all this stuff is happening lightning strike and all kinds of stuff. He's setting a picture up. He's setting and paving a way. Y'all need to wake up because God about to show up. And when he's going to come in, he's going to make some noise. He's going to shake, rattle, and roll. And so Job didn't need to understand that. They didn't understand that, but they want to understand it real quick because then all of a sudden at the end, he says, look, for as for the Almighty, 37, 23, as for the Almighty, we cannot find him. He is excellent in power and judgment and abundant justice. He ain't slack on it. He ain't going to hold it back. He does not oppress. Therefore, men fear him. He shows no partiality to anyone who are wise of heart. That means it don't matter if you got or don't got, had or don't have. He don't care. So, after he sets this scene, Elihu says what he has to say. He was a servant of the Lord, and he said, this young man speaking to these older men. Okay, Elihu's time to shut up. He's going to be quiet. He's going to take a seat. God shows up. In verse th chapter 38, God shows up. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. <sighs> And said, 
Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. That's how God started his conversation with Job. What you going to do? God shows up like that. Who is this who darkens my counsel? Like, you know. By words without knowledge. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. And he gets into it. I'm like, oh, Lord. I want to hide. <laughs> he keeps, I'm not going to get it. You need to read it. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined his measurement? Surely you know or stretched the line upon it. To what were his foundations fastened or who laid his cornerstone? I'm like, Lord, that's enough. Stop. Stop. So from thir verse 38, I mean, excuse me, chapter 38 to 42, God just reams Job anew. Oh, it's painful. Painful. So here's the thing. What happened at the end is what God wanted to happen. Job finally came to the realization, if you go to chapter 42, Job came to the realization that he needed to repent. And Job initially thought that when God showed up, if God showed up, that would crush him. But it didn't. It didn't crush him. It overwhelmed him. It made him submit to God. He didn't get rid of him. And if you understand, it, again, in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to forget what I was in the but it says that every man is going to make something. He's going to make it of, of some materials. It's going to be good. It's going to be straw. It's going to be hay. It's going to be stone. It's going to be whatever. But every man's work is going to be tested by the refiner's fire. And it's going to be tested. And what is not of God is going to burn up. And what is of God is going to be purified. The ones whose stuff is going to burn up, they're going to escape it the flames as one's escaping the fire, but they won't be consumed. But their stuff won't burn up. God's going to save them much like Job. His stuff burnt up. Lost it. He had to see God for who God really was, and that's what it was here. That's what really happened in verse 5 and 6 of chapter 42. Job says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now, my eyes sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself. I hate myself. And repent in dust and ashes. When you compare yourself to God's righteousness, your junk is nothing but filthy rags. And oftentimes we get caught up comparing ourselves with ourselves or comparing ourselves with sister such and such or brother so and so. They're not the standard. I don't want to be reminded, Lord. I don't. I don't I, I, Lord, I don't want to go through what Job went through to, to learn that lesson. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. Job had to learn that lesson. Elihu brought him to that point that he could learn that lesson. Later, in verse 10 of 42, then the Lord doubled Job's blessings, and the Lord restored Job's losses, but he only restored his losses after Job prayed for his friends. The ones that came and cursed him for what happened, Job then prayed for them in spite of what they quote-unquote did to him. Then, indeed, Lord gave Job twice as much as what he had. So he had to get Job to a point. All of what Job went through wasn't to crush him, but was to make him realize who God really was and to bless him. Not just to bless him, but then all of a sudden to restore what you have. I'm going to give you more. 
But at the same time, you're going to draw closer to me. And that's what happened. But Elihu, this young man, this grandson, brought Job to that point. Where is Elihu? I say it to my young people. You can be him. Even if you're her, you can be him. Know what it is that it is the wisdom from God comes from above. Don't come from the spirit of God. You want it? Ask for it. He'll provide it. And then to, to the seasoned ones out here, do you have somebody like that? That can come to you and speak some kind of wisdom of God that you can learn from them and what they're going through that can help also apply to your own life. That's important. Very, I remember some of the best conversations I ever had with my grandfather. Minister Timothy Boyd, he knows all kinds of stuff. We would sit down and talk spiritual stuff. And he would listen to me. And I'm saying that this man knows the Bible from cover to cover, inside out, upside down. I can barely get the Beatitudes right. But he listened. And he learned from me as much as I learned from him. So the question is, even for the, from the seasoned veterans out here, do you have somebody like that? Where's your Lahu? Do we have a Lahu? Where's a Lahu? Because in the instance of this case, a Lahu is a precursor to God showing up. And that's what we want. We really want God to show up. We don't want him necessarily to set the house in order. We want him to come. Hopefully he comes and the house is already in order. But we want him to show up. And I hope he has. I hope he showed up here today. I hope somebody. I hope somebody can understand that God needs to show up in your life. Wisdom, we all want it. We all seek it. We want it. True wisdom comes from the Lord. You can't get it unless you have a relationship with him first. And then once you have the relationship with him, all of that is provided. Just ask. It's like a kid. When you're a kid, you sit at your parents' feet and you just listen and listen to what they got to say. You're not s s skeptical of the things that they say. Because you trust what they're saying to be true. Allow the Lord to come into your life and all of those things will be answered. He'll clarify that stuff. Stuff that was confusing will be confusing no more. And particularly the path of your life will be fixed for you. So, hopefully God showed up here in your life with somebody out there who wants God to come into their life. And I'm turning this over to, to Brother Chris, Chris Robinson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Derek Adams. We have the privilege of getting that from him consistently. I have a relationship with him. And thank you, Brother Adams, for constantly encouraging me, admonishing me, being patient with me. Amen. And the call right now is twofold. The first is the invitation to come to know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He sent his only son who came, suffered, bled, and died on the cross for the sin of the whole world. And he commands all men everywhere to repent in order to bring that relationship together. You have to come to know the Lord Jesus. Brother Derek Adams said today, He'll say to you, depart from me, I never knew you, ye that work iniquity. It is important to come before him and repent towards Jesus, towards God, and put our faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Is there one that doesn't know the only God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent?
or want to learn more of him, please come. That's the first invitation. Please come. I would also like to invite those who are looking for a church home. I came to Huber in November 2015. We had to visit here when I was a college football player at Morgan State University. And I can still remember the two messages, if I'm not mistaken. The first one, when we came one year, it was on Joseph's life and not letting people sabotage your dreams. And then the next one that we heard was pastor encouraging us to get a life, get a wife, then make a life. <laughs> so I'm, I'm saying that to say, I'm saying that to say, this is a good place to grow. As you can see, I have brothers like brother Derek Adams who pour into me and I've grown. Although I still have more growing to do, I'm grateful. So we're just inviting those who are looking for a church home and looking for a place to grow and be sharpened to come. Please come. went forth Is there anybody else prior to Pastor coming up? Is there anybody else? Thank y'all so much for those that came down. <laughs> 